Hi, I'm Megan. Hi, I'm Rebecca. And we're Sister Goals. Talking about a book that is called Helter Skelter. It's written by Vincent Bugliosi. And it is an entire book about the Tate LaBianca murders, which took place in the 60s. And they are most commonly known as the Manson murders. So we are going to talk about this book. Uh, Vincent Bugliosi was the DA that prosecuted um, the family members in this trial. And it's a very detailed account of the murders, what happened during the trial, post-trial, and what did you think, Becca? It was good. Uh, let's start with, there is a lot to unpack in this book. So you're starting out with the physical murders that have occurred. You're finding the bodies is where you're starting this whole story off. And then you're just building on top of like how Vincent Bugliosi put together his investigation uh, once he was approached that he was going to be taking over uh, the case and prosecution, trying to prosecute uh, Charles Manson. So there's a lot. So the beginning is hard because you're, you're hearing very gory details. It was not a pleasant crime scene whatsoever. Uh, 40 plus stab wounds in one victim. It was very bloody. Then we move on in our progress where they're trying to find evidence. And the interesting thing that I found about this book is how, how would you say it? He's trying to be nice about his frustrations with the law enforcement people that had been assigned to him for the case and to find as detectives, the information he needs so that he could prosecute when they found, at the time, at the beginning, they didn't know who had done it. So when they found who they were going to try and prosecute for these murders. So that's like one whole section within itself. So let's start with that section, Megan. What do you think of the first section? <laughs> so there, there were two murders, which I didn't realize um, that they were able to charge and build them up with the case against. So the first one being the tape murders which took place um at the you know famous house Sharon Tate was the actress so that one gets a lot of the um publicity that that was the only one that I knew of and then a few days later in a different jurisdiction of LA there was um a married couple that uh, were also killed and those are the La Bianca. so when the family was prosecuted they um were able to build this case against them for both murders and that is um why they have two separate jurisdictions of the police departments and why as he's uh writing this you can tell which police department he got frustrated with so if you want to <laughs> find out which one he obviously didn't like uh you can <laughs> write the book so there's um a lot to this section it's interesting with the way that it's written from um the third person so you're looking i'm sorry an omniscient narrator so he's like taking you away from it and you're watching the scenes unfold and so that part's interesting and then as we go on to the next section he switches to the personal narrative of him receiving the case and becoming the lead prosecutor against it and how hard it was to build the case so i think that is what really struck me in this first part of the book i thought it was just you know, like, wham, bam, we're done, case closed, like, they obviously did it, and I didn't realize how much had to get sifted through, and how challenging it was for them to build the case, and to come up with a motive for this. Um, what else did you think, Boo? I think in that section, second section as well, that is interesting, I almost feel that, that he starts in about how he's trying to piece together the case on the second part, but I wouldn't say, I'd say the third part is the trial. Mm -hmm. So in the second part though, you start to find out about the family, which is what Charles Manson used to call his followers that had followed him from Haight-Ashbury around and then settled at a spawn ranch, which is where 
the murders, supposedly like where he kept all his weapons and they have proof of that from police raids that they did and all of that. So you learn about Spawn Ranch. So you learn more about the people in the second part. So you learn about, let me get everyone's <laughs> names here so we don't forget all of them. So you learn about Susan, the accomplices. So you learn about Sexy Sadie, Susie At Susan Atkins. You learn about, there's another Charles as well, but his name, he follows, what, what do they call him again? Um, Tex. So instead of his, his real name's Charles as well, but they, he goes by Tex and just all these different members, uh, Linda, Kasabian and Lydia. It, it just, there's, there's a lot of names in here. So just to warn you, when you're reading this, if you are reading it, it may be a really good idea to have like a document where you can write down or because for me, I was listening to this book. It was a lot different, but Megan, since you read it, did they include those information about the people inside the text, the hardcover? As if, as in a chart version? Yes. Like, no, no. So I would definitely say if you're reading this, the names are overwhelming. So our mother had some background. She does this, uh, book club with us, but she lived during the time of these murders and when they took place. So she was very well aware of like the circumstances, the people, you know, she had a lot of background versus we um, had the ideas and, you know, like in the back of our mind. So it wasn't in the forefront of like our, our news life growing up. And when it came time to like keep track of all the people, it was incredibly overwhelming for me. And I would say that would be my one um, struggle. The one big struggle <laughs> is like just keeping track of the characters um, is really challenging. I think unless you have some background in it or, or um, maybe hands-on during that period. Yes, very challenging, so. Yeah, so it could definitely, I think, help you in regards on this. Maybe if you're not creating a list, sometimes I would even look it up during, while reading this book, just to kind of remember who was who within the book. So just be careful about that. Uh, like Megan said, our mom did grow up with it. Um, so she did know a lot more than us. I actually didn't know much. I just knew this Charles Manson was a murderer. and. Um, couple you know a couple years ago heard he had passed and I th that's the extent that I knew in regards to him so this was a completely deep dive into this book <laughs> but going on to part three I guess would be the trial what'd you think Megan the trial was interesting to see some of the antics of the defendants during the trial so I didn't I could imagine that would have been very newsworthy back in the day and why it would have been covered extensively. Just some of the ways that they would call out, some of the things they would do to their bodies ahead of time, different ways that they would interact with one another um, during the trial would be very unusual and atypical in a courtroom scene. So that was interesting to me. Um, going through this, I never thought about the jury and how long this trial lasted and how long they had to be sequestered. So I think I felt a lot of empathy for those jurors, uh, just their task that they were placed with and what they had to do and how much they had to sacrifice for so long. And later on in the trial, um, the Bugliosi writes about all of the ways that each lawyer themselves had to kind of pay for uh, what they gave up in their careers or their practices to be able to prosecute and or defend the defendants in this trial and what that cost them personally. And I had never really thought of any of those things. So I really appreciated um, Bugliosi bringing those threads into the story. It kind of humanizes the trial and um, helps you see that everyone involved is a, a person that's um, being affected by it. obviously the victim's families and so forth as well but um, uh, yeah. I think in this what's important to talk about in the trials as well and when they're creating these cases is the challenges that the prosecutors and the DA had in regards on this case is that there was a belief that there was many more deaths that they could not prove. Mm -hmm. So 
there was even a lawyer who disappeared during the trial. Mm -hmm. uh, and we get into it later in the book about when they found people, when they never found people, the thoughts, the beliefs. But this part, um, I guess when I was reading just a little summary to try and understand what was happening in this trial, I didn't understand why they weren't going after each of the murders mm -hmm. at like all together, but they did it in separate trials. So then he's also talking about separate trials. So like the Tate LaBianca was one trial. Tex uh, Charles was another trial where they got him for a different murder. And like Sadie and they had different murders that they tried to go through um, to prove that the group did it. And then it's just, it's a lot, you know, the, the trial, the jurors, like Megan said, they had to be sequestered for what was it? Six or seven months. That's crazy. The longest in history. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's like, Oh my gosh. And then, but how scary it must have been because there was a lot of threats during the trial to these jurors and to the councils and everything. And it just, it's just super scary. Uh, it must have been a very unnerving time. And you were talking about antics. I mean, Megan, they're like one of the huge antics I say, like towards the very beginning is Charles Manson, like drew an X on his head um, and said, you're canceling me. You're not listening to me. So I'm already a dead man. And yeah, it was very theatrical. It seemed throughout the trial, his followers would stand on the curbside, sleep on the curbs next to the courthouse. And at this time, you know, they were very dangerous to many people's opinions, not everyone, but there, it wasn't known to being the sweet and happy love that you would think um, was associated with the hippies at the time. But as always, thank you everyone for joining us today. Remember to like, subscribe, and share. <laughs> Have a wonderful day. Bye.